This is Thursday, December 2nd, 2021. This interview for the Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts is being recorded via Zoom. My name is Maureen Sullivan, Project Coordinator, and we are privileged to have with us today, Hilbert Hibby Margo. Welcome, Hibby. Thank you. And before we proceed, I want to give a special thanks to Jackson Heckenberg. He's a student in Canada who's been reaching out to veterans in both Canada and the United States to hear their stories and to thank them for their service. Uh, Jackson found our website a few months ago and through a series of emails, we proceeded to uh, set up a nice interview with Mr. Marvel. So thank you, Jackson. Thank you, Hibby. And now let's begin. May I ask when you were born? February 22nd, 1924. And where were you born? Jacksonville, Florida, USA. I understand you were uh, part of a set of identical twins. Correct. Yeah, I was the older by 10 minutes. In fact, my bro twin brother, at times he used to tell people that he was my younger brother. So I used to tell him, okay, I'm the original, he was the copy. <laughs> oh boy. And what community uh, do you, uh, where do you live now? Dunwoody, Georgia, suburb of Atlanta. And your marital status? Well, November 7th of this year, we celebrated our 73rd wedding anniversary. And what's your wife's name? Anne. So congratulations to the both of you. And, and do you have children? Yep, a boy and two girls. And we have eight grandchildren, two great-grandchildren, and one in the oven on the way. Congratulations. So tell us a bit about uh, growing up in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, we grew up in a very nice mixed neighborhood. And when I say mixed, I'm referring to between uh, Jews and non-Jews. Uh, it was you know, a period where segregation was in order. So uh, that was pretty much it. It was a, a very nice neighborhood, very calm, very peaceful, no crime problems, uh, schools, parks in the area to occupy our time growing up. And um, we had bicycles and, you know, we wasn't too far to go to the river downtown so we could go on our bikes to do a little fishing, things like that growing up. What did your father do for a living? Well, our father started out in Jacksonville as a peddler. And he peddled ice for a while, a few years. Uh, those days, you had ice boxes. We didn't have refrigerators. So he would sell ice to homes to put in their refrigerators to keep the food somewhat cold. And um, then he switched over to selling clothing from a push cart. And once he graduated, got some success there, then he opened a small ladies and men's clothing store in, located in the Black Business District in Jacksonville. And that's why I Growing up, I had a lot of contact with a lot of Black American people, both adults, some children, youngsters. And, you know, it, it became normal for me and my brother, two brothers and sister, to uh, know how to contact and get along with the Black citizens, although segregation was in order. Was your family affected by the Great Depression? Very much so. Because when the banks closed and my father had this small clothing store, uh, it was very difficult. And uh, of course, most people lost what money they had. You know, couldn't get to it because it was in the banks. And I remember 
he had a number of customers that worked at a nearby sawmill. So the sawmill issued script stating on the script that if they would honor it, when things got better, the sawmill would reimburse the merchants uh, and would pay off the script. So my father took a lot of script from his customers to provide them with clothing needs. Of course, as things turned out later, the sawmill went bankrupt. So they got no remuneration whatsoever. And it was a very tough period. Uh, you know, that period is referred to as the greatest generation growing up during the depression. And my personal thoughts uh, were that that's why World War II, uh, the soldiers, sailors, Marines uh, were more prepared for the tough going in combat because most of us knew tough going growing up. We didn't have a necessarily easy life. So that made things a little easier. Now, do you remember when Pearl Harbor was attacked in December, 1941? Very much so. I remember it was Sunday. And I remember when President Roosevelt came on the radio, everybody was glued to the radio. TV was not available in those days. And I remember President Roosevelt announcing that Pearl Harbor was attacked. And uh, everybody knew, and that brought the country together. Now, at the time, you and your brother were still in high school, correct? Yes. That was December 7th, and uh, 19, we graduated, 1941, we graduated high school. We were midtermers, and we graduated high school in the middle of January of 1942. We were just before our 18th birthdays. So it's January 42, the month after the attack. Uh, did you and your brother try to enlist? Well, our, we knew at some point we would end up in the military <clears throat> service, but our main objective at the, point, at the time was to get in as much college as we could. So late January of 42, we entered as freshmen at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. Total student body at the time, they surprised you, was only 3,000 all male students. Today, the university, of course, is co ed and they have upwards of 50,000 students. And what was your major? Well, we majored in accounting and we wanted to get accounting degrees, uh, majored in accounting, minors in economics. And our dream was to go to Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania and end up as CPAs. And that was our objective. And I understand both you and your brother took part in ROTC. Yes, we joined the ROTC program at the University of Florida. And at the time they had horse-drawn artillery consisting of 105 millimeter howitzers. So we both were trained as gunners on these 105 millimeter howitzers. The howitzers were real, the horses were real, but our rifles were made out of wood. <laughs> but the howitzers were real. And how long were you at Florida? Well, uh, ROTC, in October, late October uh, of 42, an army officer came to the campus, talked to all the ROTC students and said, if we joined a army reserve unit, there'd be a good chance they would let us stay in college and finish college. So we bet and my brother and I joined the army reserve unit. That was late October. And a few months later, 
our reserve unit was called to active duty. So much for college. So we were ordered to report uh, April the 3rd, 1943, Camp Landing, Florida for active duty. And when you were called to active duty, uh, were you still gunners or were you going to go through basic? No, we were there for assignment for just maybe four or five days at Camp Landing. And, uh, you know, at the time, to us, we didn't know what to expect. It was sort of going to a great adventure, so to speak. And at, at our age at the time, we were sent to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. 13 weeks of basic training. Again, as gunner, we were highly trained as gunners on 105 millimeter howitzers, field artillery. And what was basic like? Well, basic training was a learning army life, how to take orders, don't ask questions, just follow the orders and do as you're told. Uh, we had 10, 15 mile hikes. Uh, at Fort Bragg at the time, the 82nd Airborne Division was also training there. So when we'd be on a 10 mile hike, they would be, we passed them, they passed us on a 15 mile hike. If we did a 15 mile hike, they did a 20 mile hike. And that was pretty much it. So it was, you know, a lot of, a lot of work during the day, training, doing the same things over and over and over again uh, for 13 weeks. At the end of 13 weeks, we were interviewed, offered the opportunity to go to officer's candidate school. So we looked at each other and asked the interviewer, what, what does that involve? He said, well, in approximately three months, you'll come out both as second lieutenants. In those days, they called them 90-day wonders. So we looked at each other and said, well, if we do that, uh, they're not going to keep us together. They'll separate us and send us to two different outfits. So what else is available? So they said, well, they just started a new Army program, ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. We go back to college and take courses in engineering some genius in Washington at the time decided that whenever the war would end, the country would be short of engineers. So we said, fine, going back to college looks, sounds good to us. So we were assigned to the Army Specialized Training Program. And from there, they sent us to the Citadel in South Carolina, which was not a good experience. Fortunately, it was only about two weeks and from there, they sent us to Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York, three or four months there. Then we were transferred to the University of Illinois, Champaign, Illinois. Nobody told us why, what, why, what this was all about. And then after three or four months there, taking these engineering courses, some general decided they had 137,000 thousand young soldiers in colleges and they needed them for combat duty. So they disbanded the program and that's when they separated us. My brother was sent, my brother Howard was sent to the 104th Timberwolf Division training in the Mojave Desert, in California for the North African campaign. I was sent to the 42nd Infantry Division in Camp Gruber, Oklahoma. And what kind of training were you getting down in Oklahoma? Well, when I arrived, typical army, they put me in the infantry. And here I had all this training in the artillery. So after about two months in the infantry, uh, they woke up and transferred me over to the artillery section. And once again, I was a gunner on a 105 millimeter howitzer. Meanwhile, my brother Howard and Mojave Desert, also in the infantry. And then they decided after some 
weeks. They didn't need any more troops for the North African campaign. So they moved his division to Colorado, Pikes Peak area. He was still in the infantry, hauling a, a pack mule, leading a pack mule up and down Pikes Peak, training for the Italian campaign. Boy, when you said adventure, you weren't kidding. <laughs> In the meantime, though, uh, your mother was working behind the scenes to get you back together. Tell us about that. Well, my brother Howard had put in three requests for transfer to my outfit from Colorado to Oklahoma. Uh, nothing happened. He went to his captain and finally and said, what's the status of my transfer request? His captain said, my job is to train you, not to transfer you. So hearing that, he wrote a letter to our mother, told her what, was, what happened. She decided to write a letter to President Roosevelt. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, she got a letter from the White House, not signed by the president, but signed by his military aide. So the letter said that as a two-star mother, her request would be granted. Her request was that we be able to serve together again, but the letter didn't say who's going where. Well, I'm going to him, he's coming to me. A couple of weeks later, she got another letter from the War Department basically saying the same thing. Still didn't know. Fortunately, the third letter came from division headquarters of the 104th Division, where Howard was, giving orders for him to be transferred to my outfit in Oklahoma. His captain tried talking out of accepting the transfer. They sent him up to division headquarters. Some colonel did the same thing. Howard's answer to both of them was the same thing. I obey military orders. I'm ready to go. So they finally arranged for him to get on a train headed to Oklahoma. And one interesting aspect was when he was on the train and he had, he had to change trains in Kansas City, my mother was very ill in the hospital. Mm. My division got a letter from the Red Cross requesting a emergency furlough for me to come home to see my mother in the hospital. They didn't know if she would make it or not. They couldn't locate Howard because they didn't know what train he was even on. So he reported, so I left on this emergency furlough. Howard arrived, our army serial numbers is only one digit difference. So when he checked in, the battery clerk looked at the papers and thought it was a typo error. So he thought it was me coming back. So I'd only been gone a few days. So he said, no, it's a twin brother. He's, a, he's my twin brother. They wouldn't believe him. So they signed him into the battery and they didn't believe him either because we were identical twins. We're in the same army uniform. So they gave him, he said they gave him a lot of dirty details because they thought he was, thought it was me just acting crazy trying to get a discharge. So when I came back, of course, then they realized we were twins and that changed the whole deal. So once again, we both were gunners uh, in our gun battery of four howitzers. He ended up as the, as the uh, gunner on battery on howitzer number two, and I was a gunner on howitzer number three of the four howitzers. Tell us a little bit more about the 105 howitzer. Uh, like what was its range? What kind of shells would it take? Yeah, well, we were in direct support of an infantry company, which in combat operated and training as well operated. We operate very close to the infantry regiment. Our division had three artillery batteries and three infantry regiments. And then behind us operated the 155 millimeter howitzers, the heavier guns. Behind them operated the 240 millimeter howitzers. 
So as a gunner, we were on the right side of the howitzer. We had instruments. So when we would get fire missions, we had one of our instruments was a, a small version of a carpenter's level tool with a little bubble and a small window. And when we it, it leveled the gun, uh, the bubble would be right in the middle, just like a carpenter's tool. And we would get fire missions and we would adjust the instrument to raise or lower the barrel of the gun. And then we had each gun crew was consisted of 10 men, a sergeant, a corporal, and eight uh, soldiers, privates and PFCs. And some of them were ammunition preparers. You know, they had to prepare the ammunition. The shell casing consisted of 10 powder bags. So if a fire mission came down and said seven, that meant they had to take, remove three powder bags from the shell casing and then put the projectile in it and into the uh, breach of the gun. So as a gunner, I would have my left hand with on the handle of the breech. My right hand would be a, uh, holding a rope, piece of rope. So when the shell was inserted and the casing was inserted into the howitzer, I would close it, lock the breech, and then as soon as the fire command said fire, I would pull yank on the rope to fire the missile. And we learned in train, we were so overtrained in Oklahoma over a period of time, we could do everything in our sleep. And um, so it was, you know, it was just normal to know exactly what would happen. Because once we, then we were trained and we learned in training and same thing happened in combat that the first fire mission usually was designed from the forward observer. They would call back. We had a forward, forward observer on the ground with the infantry guys. We had a forward observer flying overhead in a Piper Cub airplane over the German lines looking for targets. So by radio, they would call back to the command post giving the correlates of the target. So the first, we learned the first fire projectile was designed to go slightly above uh, and ahead of the target, behind the target. The second one was designed to go just short of the target. So then the third one was designed to boom, hit right on the target. And you know, you learn that through training. So we knew what to expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you, you and your brother were reunited. You were in the same division. Uh, we're going to reel it back a bit. This is, um, you're still in Oklahoma, correct? Uh, when did you, when were you sent to Europe? Well, this was, uh, it just so happened in, uh, I guess, either sometime in early December when the Battle of the Bulge broke out. They took our three infantry regiments and they rushed them over because of the Battle of the Bulge. So the three infantry units, uh, regiments, were thrown in for the last few days of the Battle of the Bulge with very little support because the rest of the division at that time had left later in December for port of embarkation. So we weren't, we weren't over there. They had very little support. And because of that, they got to pretty heavy casualties. So, which it, it, it added, in some respect, it added to our good fortune because uh, later in December, we got orders, we loaded on the troop train, took off and uh, the trains took off. We didn't know where we were going. Pacific, Europe, they never told us anything. Everything was top secret. But at some point it started snowing and we never saw the ground 
bare ground again until we arrived at Camp Kilner, New Jersey. And we knew that the train went north across Canada because we saw the road signs and some we saw in French. So we knew we had to be somewhere in Canada because of the French signs. And then we crossed down into the state of New York, into New Jersey, Camp Kilmer, for a period of a few days, a week or so in Camp Kilmer before boarding a troop ship to ship overseas. And of course, until we got out to sea, they didn't tell us where we were going. But the fact we knew we left from New York meant we were going to Europe. We, we all knew that. How long did it take to cross the Atlantic? Well, we were in a very large convoy. The, the troop ship that we were on was 5,000 men in that one ship. There were other ships carrying the rest of the division, but, um, and a lot of other ships, and, you know, naval ships, destroyers, minesweepers, you name it, uh, submarines, uh, and the, the trip took 15 days because it, it wasn't a direct route. It had to zigzag to uh, escape the German submarines. And uh, we entered the Mediterranean at the Rock of Gibraltar and arrived at Marseille, France, about the middle of January, 1945. And uh, I can go ahead and add, when we got off the troop ship, then they transported us in army trucks to an area north of Marseille, because at that point, combat activities were well north of Marseille. And a place called CP2, Command Post 2, there was, the weather was extremely cold. We were looking forward to Marseille, France, but we learned in geography that southern sunny France. But when we arrived, it was extremely cold. And of course, the locals said it's the coldest weather in a hundred years. Well, we heard that before in the States at times. So anyhow, this command post was a very barren, rocky, very windy, very cold place. And they gave us two-man pup tents. And we slept in our sleeping bags and these little tents. And uh, the reason why we had to remain there for a couple of weeks because we had to wait for the infantry uh, units to get replacements. And they, for the most part, they were getting replacements fresh out of basic training. So we had to go on maneuvers around the French countryside, for them, especially their officers, to get trained and our forward observers to get trained with them to operate together. So we were like on maneuvers, the same experience we had in Oklahoma many times. And uh, finally, one night close to midnight, we were ordered to go into a particular gun position and dig in our howitzers. And we thought, well, this was all the start of the training. And uh, well, early, very early, at the break of dawn the next morning, when shells start flying over our heads, we decided, hey, this must be the real thing. We're in combat now, and of course it was. So your first taste of combat, uh, what's going through your mind? Well, we had our howitzers dug in. We were ordered to dug, out, dug in our foxholes, which we did, and um, put over camouflage nets over our guns. And then we were open for some firing missions. And this happened to be a, a, a village wing. The village name was Wingen, Wingen Sur Motor, uh, on the Motor River. Nearby was a Motor River. They called it a river. We would, in this country, we would call it a, a large creek. We were dug in on one side of the river. The German on the other side was what they called a mountain. We called a high hill. The Germans were dug in on the other side of that high hill mountain. And it took two or three days 
to learn by the difference in the sound. You learned which shells were fired by the Germans going over our heads to targets behind us and which shells were being fired by the 155 millimeter howitzers and the 240 millimeter howitzers behind us going to targets over the German lines. And you could finally figure out by the difference in the sound, which, and if they got, if the incoming shell sounded closer, that's when you jumped into your foxhole. It took a while to learn that. And um, so we were there for, I don't know, maybe a, a week or 10 days in that position before we got orders to pull out and head north. And, you know, the infantry, would, we always set up our howitzers. When we got fire missions, we were always set up our howitzers outside of cities and towns and villages because the infantry guys ahead of us, they were the ones that would go into these cities, towns, and villages to clean out any uh, German troops. We were firing, some of our fire missions, of course, were designed to hit targets in those villages, towns, and cities. So when the infantry guys were able to clean out the snipers and whatever, then we would motor through those cities, towns, and villages. So we would see the resulting damages of the bombed out buildings and roads and bridges and whatnot. Uh, but we never knew which was caused by aerial bombardments and which was caused by our firing uh, missiles, projectiles. Now, aside from the German guns, were, did you actually see any of the enemy? Only dead ones. Only dead ones. <laughs> there was no shortage of, you know, uh, destroyed tanks, both American tanks, Allied tanks, German tanks, uh, all kind of German vehicles, dead horses, because, you know, at some point in combat, when the Germans ran out of fuel for any vehicle, if they could locate nearby horses, they would hook up the horses to the vehicle to pull the vehicles because they had no fuel. So of course there were a lot of dead horses along the way, along the dead vehicles, dead soldiers and whatnot. As things progressed, you know, we went through Northern France, uh, through the Maginot Line, and so Siegfried Line and whatnot, and then crossed over into Germany. I understand you, uh, you know, you're taking part in the Alsace and Ardennes campaigns and also Rhineland. Um, any thoughts on those? Sorry. Clar <clears throat> I'm sorry. Clarify that. Repeat. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, according to the, uh, to the note you sent along to Jackson, you, you know, you saw action, of course, in Alsace and Ardennes uh, and then the Rhineland. Yes. Uh, do you have any further um, stories about those campaigns? Well, you know, I could, excuse me, I could tell you uh, the first town uh, in Germany that we entered was called Don, D A H N. And it, the only experience there, because as I mentioned, we were always on the outskirts. And when Don was captured and the Germans were all gone, one incident there that I remember very vividly because our division chaplain, our, one of our division chaplains was a former rabbi, Eli Bonin from Providence, Rhode Island. And he became a favorite of our division commander, General Harry Collins. Walter Winchell gave him the nickname of Hollywood Harry. He was quite a showman, but he also was a great general for his troops. That I will say, he was admired by all his troops because he respected his soldiers. So it so happened that Chaplain Bonin looked at his Jewish calendar at the time, because this was late March of 1945. And he saw that we got, when Don was under control our division was given orders for two day rest period. 
the 45th Division was always on our left in combat. The 36th Texas Division was always on our right in combat. So when we got orders to rest for two days, that meant those two divisions moved forward and we could stay in place for two days. So Chaplain Bowen looked at his Jewish calendar and said, the next evening would be the first night of Passover. So he went to General Collins and told him, is it possible, if it's at all possible, he would like to arrange to have a Passover Seder in Don, Germany. General Collins liked the idea. He sent the rabbi, Chaplain Bowen, and his Jeep driver with a couple of trucks back to France, and they got freshly killed chickens, French wine, and other ingredients they were able to get, brought it back to Don, we had a Seder that night in a school, but former school building. And it was really great that General Collins was there, our assistant division commander, General Henning Linden was there. They both spoke. It was, uh, and one oddity was Chaplain Bonin had a small prayer pamphlet. It's called a Haggadah that's used just during that service. So he found a mimeograph machine in that school building, but it was dirty, dusty. So they went looking for rags to clean it in order to print copies of this little prayer book. So the only thing they could find was a Nazi flag. So they used a Nazi flag to clean that mimeograph machine and able to print out enough copies because there were about 800 soldiers there not only from the 42nd Division, but some from other attached uh, units. And uh, so we had a, well, that was a memory. And I didn't keep my copy, but my brother Howard kept his copy, which he kept for years until he donated it to a local museum here in Atlanta. But that was the memory of Don Germany. From there, we went to Mer Wurzburg, then Nuremberg, uh, you know, in each, in each one of those areas, as I mentioned, our howitzers would be set up on the outskirts. Sometimes the howitzers were quite a distance apart before howitzers would be spread out quite a distance apart. And it determined the distance of, of each howitzer was separated, determined by the terrain and the situation. Sometimes they were closer together, sometimes they were farther apart. Uh, when Nuremberg was uh, being captured, a suburb called Firth, F-U-R-T-H, was a suburb of Nuremberg. There was a German army base there that our infantry company was uh, ordered to capture, and we supported them. So once the air base was under control, all the German soldiers, had, airmen, whatever, had left. Uh, at our howitzers were quite a distance apart. And I found out a couple of days later, my brother Howard went into one of the buildings at the air base. He saw a stack of German white silk parachutes. He, it was wintertime, of course, so he took his bayonet and he cut off a large piece of one of the silk parachutes and made himself a nice neck scarf. And of course, when I saw him with that neck scarf and we got closer together a couple of days later, where'd you get that? And he told me what he did. And I said, well, what, where's my neck scarf? You know, he didn't think it was brother at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Brotherly love. And one thing I'll say, the, re the main reason we wanted to get together once they separated us was because you know, when you're thrown into an army, our gun battery consisted of 100 men. And you're suddenly together with guys that you didn't know, all strangers. And to have a brother, a relative, a very close friend with you made a world of difference because you knew you had somebody you could trust at all times, in all situations. And that was the main reason we wanted to get together. From there, 
while you're looking up another question, we went from Nuremberg. Uh, the next military objective was Munich. And that's where we were headed. And then I'll wait for your next question. Oh, go right ahead. Okay, well, so now here it is. We're headed to Munich. And it's April the 29th, 1945 very early in the morning and we got orders. We were on a two lane country road. We got orders to pull off to the right side of the road and set up our howitzers. This was a very, on both sides of the road were wooded, heavily wooded areas. But on the right side, there was just enough of a clearing to accommodate our four howitzers. This was as close together as our howitzers had ever been. So we set up our howitzers and we received and executed some firing missions towards Munich. At the time, we were told we were somewhere between nine and 10 miles north of Munich. So we did some firing missions. Everybody smelled a very strong odor. Some, one of our Jeep drivers came by and said, it must be a chemical factory on the other side of the woods, on the left side of the road, there was a strong odor. Since our howitzers were so close together, my brother Howard came over to me. He said, he doesn't think there's a chemical factory over there. The odor reminds him when we were kids and our mother would go to a meat market to buy a freshly killed chicken. In those days, you had to buy the whole chicken. You couldn't buy just like parts like you can today. She would take the chicken home, hold it over the gas flame of the stove in the kitchen to burn off any remaining pin feathers. In so doing, it would burn some of the skin and the fat of the chicken and give off the odor. Howard said, that's the odor that reminds him of. So I asked my gun sergeant permission for Howard and I, could we go over there and locate the source of this very strong odor? So he gave permission for us to go, but he said, don't stay too long because we, we now have a low, we haven't had any fire emissions in, in a while. So we don't, we, we don't know how long we're gonna be here. So off we went, I guess we walked through that wood area about 15 minutes or so. And the first thing we saw was a line of railroad boxcars. We crawled over between two of the boxcars. And when we got on the other side to our right, the first boxcar and several more, the sliding doors were open. And the infantry guys were walking alongside the train, opening more sliding doors. Inside the bo first boxcar we saw was a lot of dead bodies. One body, his leg was hanging outside the door. And we had a little brownie box camera that we had liberated somewhere along the way. And we only had, the only film we had was what was inside the camera when we found it. So we didn't take a lot of pictures because we were very, we only wanted to take special pictures of something. So we took a picture of that particular boxcar with the dead people inside. And we could tell with the leg hanging out, which was somewhat different than the other. The other boxcars were the same scene, just nothing but dead bodies. They were all, for the most part, they were all wearing these striped pajamas. So that told us that they were all apparently Jewish prisoners from somewhere. We didn't know what we were seeing. We didn't understand fully what we were seeing because we knew very little about such things. Liberating the various camps was not a military objective. So that's why they didn't tell us anything about these camps. The officers knew, the headquarters knew, they knew all about it, but we didn't. So we took one picture and then we noticed some soldiers going through a nearby building through a gate. 
So we followed them inside the gate. We walked in, there was a large open area with some buildings and then a series of a lot of buildings and everything was quiet. There was really nothing going on, very little activity, just us and other soldiers sort of walking around. And, you know, we saw maybe a handful of guys sitting, squatting, leaning against one of the buildings. They looked very emaciated. They didn't say anything. They just stared at us and we looked at them. We knew that we couldn't stay there very long. And we saw in several places, we saw stacks of dead bodies, which there again, we didn't understand. We didn't know what it was all about, but certainly that was the source of the strong odor. And we realized that. So we took off and went back to our unit and we got back just in time because maybe 15 minutes later, we got orders to pull out and head towards Munich. And the only reason why we knew we were at Dachau was because we saw the road sign of the nearby village that said Dachau. And then later we learned about where this train of dead people came from. It just so happened, we learned in years after the war that the train was loaded with prisoners from Buchenwald prisoner camp. It took and it was destined because they knew that the uh, American army was coming close to Buchenwald. So they loaded up a few thousand of these prisoners and put them in these railroad boxcars. And of course, wintertime, very cold. And they put them, they packed them in like sardines in each railroad boxcar. They gave them a large porcelain pot with the bathroom. They gave them a loaf of dark black bread, some raw potatoes, locked the doors, and away they went. It took 20 days for that train to reach Dachau. And by that time, all but a small number of prisoners had died from freezing cold, malnutrition, and so forth. And there's a lot more story to the train but I'll save that for some other time because it can take a lot more time. Well, Hippy, even after all these years, I know it's never easy to recall uh, experience like that. So I do want to thank you for sharing that with us. So now you're on your way to Munich. Tell us what happened next. Well, by the time we got to Munich, and there again, we were always on the outskirts. So we actually bypassed Munich because really there was almost no combat at all in Munich. Munich was prepared to surrender because Munich was the original home headquarters of the Nazi party. And the American army, when our division was close to Munich, the German soldiers, officers all took off. Now, it just so happened, another story, that I was able to go to the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Dachau. And one of the stories, one of the, uh, I was anxious to go because when I was invited, because I was told there were gonna be a number of survivors there, in addition to a small number of liberators. So I wanted to talk to some of the survivors. I asked each one of them the same question. Where were you at? What were you doing early in the morning of April 29th, 1945? So one that I spoke to, him and his family live in Montreal, Canada, still today. And he said he wasn't in the camp. I said, well, if you weren't in the camp, where were you? He said, well, a day or two earlier, the SS officer in charge, because the prisoner camp was quite large, but adjoining the prisoner camp was a huge German army camp that controlled the prisoner camp. So this Swiss representative arrived the day before we got there, or maybe two days before, talked to the SS general in charge and said, the American army's coming close. You have a decision to make. 
You can either fight against overwhelming odds or you can arrange for peaceful surrender of the army camp, the German army camp, the prisoner camp, and save a lot of lives. The SS officer was no dummy. He said, with consideration, he wants to leave with most of his men to defend Munich. Well, of course he did. He pulled out, but he took a few thousand of the most able Jewish prisoners on a forced march. So, and most, all but maybe a hundred German soldiers. He left one S SS junior lieutenant in charge to arrange the surrender of the camps, both camps. So his intention was not to defend Munich, but to end up at the Austrian Alps as a last redoubt. <coughs> so when I talked to this survivor, his name was Jerry, and he told me that he was part of that forced march. And he said, just before they got to the Austrian border, most of the German officers and soldiers were excuse me, and uh, vehicles. There were some German soldiers with their guns guarding the prisoners. Some of the prisoners died along the way. But he said suddenly they must have got word that the advanced units of our division was coming close. So they suddenly just took off all in the vehicles and left the prisoners just standing there. So he said that's when he was liberated, was when the advanced units of our infantry arrived and realized for those prisoners, liberation was at hand. Uh, I talked to another uh, survivor. Her daughter was with her. I asked her the same question. She said she was so ill with, this, uh, with uh, typhus that she didn't know what was going on inside the barracks or outside the barracks. But she leaned over at that point because I was in a wheelchair and she leaned over and kissed me on both cheeks and said, if you guys were a couple of days later, I wouldn't have made it. Very emotional, certainly for me and I'm sure for her. So because we found out later that when the prisoner camp at Dachau was liberated, there was over 30,000 prisoners there. A high percentage of them had, that were ill with typhus. Typhus was the, uh, born by lice. The Germans had nothing to kill the lice at the time, so they cut off the prisoner's hair. In other words, removing the hair, and the lice had no place to nest. And that was all they could do. When the American army units arrived at, at, all, at Dachau and other camps, we had DDT powder, which was used to kill the lice. And that's what they administered to all these prisoners. Uh, still, it took almost 30 days to get rid of all the lice and the typhus. And when the first, uh, first aid medical units arrived, they treated those that were near death. In other words, the body, the dead bodies they saw, they didn't bother them because they were, it was too late, they were gone. So they were there to administer the ones that were near death trying to save them. And that's the ones they administered too. And of course, there are other stories I could relate, but it would take the rest of the day. <laughs> okay, so you're near Munich, and it's early May. Right. Uh, did you hear about the formal surrender by the Germans? Well, we got uh, the news we got was mostly through our field telephones. And I remember in combat, early in April, telephone rang maybe around nine o'clock one night. 
and usually either a sergeant or corporal or whoever was on guard duty during the night in a gun position would answer the telephone and I rang. So I think our sergeant answered the phone and but we weren't asleep yet. And we heard him talking, we weren't sure, but he hung up and we thought, hey, maybe the war is over. And he announced, he had just the telephone call was announced that President Roosevelt had died. Mm -hmm. So the war wasn't over yet. But then we knew the war was over a few days before actually was over because the resistance was light. The Germans were soldiers were fleeing. We were like on a two lane road. It was bumper to bumper traffic. In other words, our vehicle, which accommodated our 10 man crew, a driver, sergeant in the front, and then in the back was the rest of our gun crew and hauling our howitzer. And there were a lot of tanks, vehicles of every type and description. And it was just, we would sit, the trucks, all the vehicles would sit for maybe 10 minutes and then move forward a short distance and then sit again. And German soldiers were coming out from the woods, especially on the right side of the road with their hands up. They apparently had discarded their guns, just dropped them in the woods somewhere and they came out with their hands up. And all we could do was motion to them, walk to the rear, walk to the rear, because what were we gonna do with them? <laughs> so we would just motion to them, just keep walking to the rear. And uh, so that was the experience. So we knew while there was no official word that the war was over, but to us, we had no fire missions. It was just bumper to bumper traffic moving slowly forward because occasionally up ahead of us, if the infantry gate ran into some diehard, diehard German soldier or sniper, boom, they got rid of him quick and went on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So a few days, this was occurring. And I also remember during that same period, there were stretches of, of the road, especially through small villages where both sides of the road would be lined with civilians. And it was like they were rehearsed, a chorus that was rehearsed. And my brother and I could, by that time, we could speak and understand pretty good German because growing up as kids, our parents spoke Yiddish. Yiddish really was a German dialect. So it was easy for us to pick up German. So. This was, I say, like a rehearsed group of civilians, and the message was always the same, hollering out, the war will not be over until you defeat the Russians. See, they welcome Allied troops, especially American troops, as liberators. They were scared to death of the Russians. So, how prophetic was that to say the war will not be over until you defeat the Russians? And we heard that in a number of villages in the last days of the war. Wow. So <clears throat> you're traveling through southern Germany, the war's about over. Where did the bumper, the bumper traffic end up? Well, when when the war was officially declared over, we then moved into two small towns in Germany, right near the Austrian border, Kufstein and Kieferstein. And the way it worked, all the months that we were in combat, we always had to remain right next to our howitzer. If it was, we were at night, we were in our sleeping bags right alongside the howitzer because we had to be prepared. If we got a fire mission, even during the middle of the night, we had to be prepared to get the ammunition ready and fire the missions. So we could not be anywhere but next to our howitzer guns, whether it was 
cold, sleet, snow, rain, you name it. That's where we were. Never inside any house or building during those months. Um, that was the way it worked. So now, they, like in the town, let's say, of Kufstein, they had these two and three story homes. And most of them contained maybe an elderly widow, a hausfrau. They would have that German uh, woman move out into one of the other neighbors. So the house would be empty and we could move in. So like one three-story house, house, you know, had a number of bedrooms so that they could accommodate quite a few soldiers. So that's where I ended up in one of those houses. And that's where we stayed for a week or so. The house trial would come every morning, make up our beds, wash our clothes, wash our linens, and wash dishes, dirty mess kits, whatever. So we bartered. We would give them uh, packages of cigarettes, candy bars, soap, in return for their work of doing whatever. In fact, in one house, either in Kustan or, or I think it was Kustan, uh, my brother and I found a bunch of picture postcards. Some of them were quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So we bartered with the house frown. We gave her items so we could take those, some of those picture postcards. And some of them recently, there was maybe six or eight of them, that the pictures were either German soldiers, like one firing a machine gun and so forth, and some other scenes, pictures of Nazi flags and whatnot, which I was able to donate about eight of them to the Holocaust Museum in Washington because they were interested in a, a getting them as part of the Nazi propaganda. In other words, why did they have picture postcards of these German soldiers and other Nazi flags, buildings, and whatnot? That was part of their propaganda effort. In fact, one of the postcards of a German soldier, he was, it was postmarked in Garmisch, the famous ski resort. I had a neighbor who could pretty well read the German handwritten message on the back. And he read me the message and it said the German soldier was sending to his family this postcard. And it said, I am not going to Russia. So his interpretation, and I think I agreed with him, was he, that meant he was really being sent to the Russian front. But if he said that, the German censors would, of course, cut it out. So by saying, I'm not going to Russia, told his family that he was being sent to the Russian front. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Uh, let's hope it didn't end up as a one-way trip. Yeah. <laughs> so during the time that you were in Austria, did you or your brother uh, have any thoughts about, okay, the war's over in Europe, but we still got things going on with Japan. Are we uh, going to be sent to the Pacific? Well, that was very much on everybody's mind. In fact, we had already been told to start preparing our howitzers and our carbine rifles for packaging. You have to put this Cosmoline product, I guess something like Vaseline yes. on them. And we didn't do it, but we were told to get, be prepared to do it, to ship over to the Pacific. So when American Air Corps, not Air Force, but Air Corps at the time, dropped the first atomic bomb. 
And believe me, everybody around us and my brother and I, we were very happy. And then the second one was dropped and of course that created the surrender because we certainly didn't. And some troops were already on ships from Europe to the Pacific, from other divisions. And of course they were all very happy. So we were very pleased that that took place. And, you know, we were in the army of occupation from a couple of weeks after the war ended. We were located in the area of Salzburg, Austria, living in a very old, uh, uh, trying to think of the name, monastery. And that's where we lived in this monastery. And they gave us every day, they gave us different duties. They called them, uh, um, it was duties to perform. And we had different things to do. Example, one of my duties was to go with another soldier to Milan, Italy. And he and I were transported there to the seaport where there was a grain ship, a ship that came either from Canada or the US filled with grain, I think wheat. And they moved the grain into railroad hopper cars. So in the middle of the train of hopper cars with this grain, they had one of these railroad box cars. And he and I lived in that box car to ride shotgun on that train to make sure it arrived safely back in Salzburg. So we had two folding cots. We had our carbine rifles, a supply of C rations and K rations. The train moved out through the Po Valley, through the Brenner Pass into Austria and into Salzburg. The purpose was to distribute the grain first to local bakers so they could use it to bake bread. Bake bread, number one, for the US soldiers, and number two, for the civilians. Uh, to have bread to eat. So that was the purpose of that green train. Uh, another, uh, they called them detail. We call them duties, they call them details. Another one nearby this monastery was a former Austrian stockade. Well, when the war ended, the 42nd Division used this stockade to house German SS officers, captured officers. So they put them in that stockade. We had to do guard duty 24 seven around that stockade. And I would tell you, we had snow days. We had to walk around on guard duty. We had to take turns on guard duty, walking in a snowstorm to guard those SS prisoners. But what we would do early every morning, we would load these former SS officers into army trucks, take them up into the wooded areas in the mountains, hills and mountains around Salzburg, chop down trees, cut the trees up into firewood, load the firewood into trucks, take it back into Salzburg, distribute it to civilians and also to the bakers. So they could have wood to burn their stoves. And that was the purpose of that. So that's for every day. Every day when it was lunchtime, they would have a trucks come up with soup for the prisoners. We had our C rations and K rations, but they would bring them soup every day. Same soup day after day, because it was the easiest thing to make. And it was what they Germans call canadal soup, which in this country we call matzo ball soup. <laughs> it's really the same thing. And that's because it was, again, a little flour, flour, 
water, make these dough balls, and cook them in the water. That was a soup. So that was a daily occurrence for quite some time. Uh, another experience I'll relate, in Salzburg we had a theater. So once a week, they would show an American movie. So of course the theater was filled with soldiers. The Germans, the Austrian civilians realized early on, the first thing the American soldiers would do when the movie was over, they would, those that smoked would come out of the theater, light up a cigarette. Because we were, our allotment, each soldier could get one carton of cigarettes a week carton of 10 packages of cigarettes was 50 cents, a nickel a pack. So the soldiers, it was, cigarettes were cheap. So, because we had plenty of German money. So, and that's another story how we acquired all that. But anyhow, so some of them would take a, a few puffs on a cigarette and then throw it down. The civilians would split up two civilians would follow each little group of soldiers going back to their living quarters. So as soon as a soldier would throw down a cigarette, they would pounce on it. Some of them, sometimes it created fights between two civilians fighting over this cigarette butt. But the object was they would take it, open it up and get the tobacco that was still in it. And they had paper they would make their own cigarettes, some for their personal use. And cigarettes were bartering tools. So they could then make cigarettes to barter to get other things, just like the American soldiers use cigarettes, candy bars, soap, excuse me, to barter souvenirs and whatever else. So <clears throat> that was an experience when I witnessed that and saw how humans were acting like dogs, animals, to grab the little bits of tobacco. To me, it was very demeaning. My brother and I never smoked. So it was very demeaning to witness that. I usually relate that story to high school kids, telling them, if they smoke, give it up, get rid of it, don't do it. If you don't smoke, don't try because with that kind of experience, you see how human beings, you know, you don't ever want to be in that position. Okay, so how long uh, were you and your brother stationed in Austria? Well, we were in the Army of Occupation <laughs> until March of 1946. And we were then transferred to the 81st Division units that were scheduled to go home. And we boarded a ship and uh, uh, Bremerhaven that got on a Liberty ship and headed back to New York Harbor. Of course, it was a much shorter voyage <laughs> going back. I think it was six or seven days in, once again, we saw New York Harbor and the Statue of Liberty and everybody was celebrating. From there, they transported us back to Fort Bragg for discharge. And Fort Bragg, they gave us our discharge papers and a train ticket home and a few dollars. And that's how we got back home. Okay. And what was your rank? PFC. PFC. And your brother? Also PFC. Yeah, we were discharged together April the 9th, 1946. Back home, we got home, we took off our army uniforms from head to toe. We donated them to a different army, the Salvation Army. That took care of that. The only thing we kept were a few souvenirs and, and we each had a German rifle that we had kept, and some souvenirs. 
And did you receive any um, medals accommodations? Well, you know, everybody for the most part got things like a good conduct medal <laughs> and we got uh, service medals. We got bronze stars for service, not bronze stars for mm -hmm. battle. Because we were in two battle campaigns, so that's what we got bronze stars. It's spelled out on our discharge papers. Okay. Nightmanship medals. Uh, I was uh, given a marksmanship medal, qualified the M1 rifle. Short months I was in the infantry. Uh, the artillery carbine rifle, qualified on that. A 45 caliber pistol. And uh, I received the marksman uh, medal for each one because uh, I had never fired a gun in my life. But I never held one, much less fired one in my life. So I had no bad habits. So when I was trained on the firing range, I did everything that the instructor told me to do. Some of the guys were not good marksmen because they learned how to fire guns early on as kids and they picked up a lot of bad habits. Oh dear. So that made a difference. I think that's what made the difference. My oldest daughter, some few years ago, decided her and her husband decided both to get guns. So she became an expert marksman. She hit the bullseye every time because I told her, I said, I know the answer, the reason. Because you never had a gun in your life. You had no bad habits. So whatever the instructor told you to do, you did. That made a difference. Okay, so um, Hibby, you, uh, what did you and your brother do after the war? Uh, did you go into any career or job or? Well, the first thing we did was make arrangements to go back to the University of Florida to finish our education. And we did, we got degrees and uh, majored in accounting, minor in economics. But during our, we had our older brother about three years. He had had double ear surgery at a 12 year old, double mastoid surgery. So it affected his hearing, his hearing was poor. So the military, he tried to sign up for the military when the war broke out, but none of the military would take him. He was classified 4F. So we had uncles, uncles in Virginia that were in the, operating a house to house business, selling housewares on credit. So he went to work for them in Virginia because he didn't want to work in our father's clothing store. It wasn't a future for him. So he went to work for them. So when we were back in college, our, during the summer between our junior and senior year, we discussed it and decided, he came back to Jacksonville, we decided to start the same business in Jacksonville. So we started doing door to door opening accounts, selling housewares, linens, blankets. Uh, at that time, things like aluminum pots and pans, silverware was on quotas. You, know, you, just, you just couldn't get them from the factories. But our uncles, since they operated during the war, they had special quotas. So they gave us part of their quota. They gave us 25 sets of aluminum pots and pans a week, 25 sets of Rogers silverware. So we had a golden opportunity. It was easy to sell those on credit. Very easy. Dollar down, dollar when we could find them home. So by the time we graduated, we would come home on weekends and I would go door to door on weekends opening new accounts. Well, my brother was, my older brother was the collector, collecting, going weekly, you know, day to day, collecting the dollar payments when he could find them home. We trusted everybody. So by the time we graduated, we said, we don't need to go to Wharton School of Finance. We got a business. So we increased that business and 
became quite successful in that business. But in the late 50s, we decided due to the advent of neighborhood shopping centers, followed by two car families, they didn't need us to come to their homes to offer them products. They could just go to the nearby shopping centers and for the most part, buy the same products, some in some cases, a few dollars cheaper. So we saw that was the future for three families. So in fact, we were each agreed to take $50 a week salary because the credit bid is so the profits were being like plowed back into the business to open more accounts. So we agreed that when each of us got married, we would get an automatic raise to $75 a week. So that's what we did. My, old, my twin brother got married first in June of 48. My wife and I get followed and got married in November of 48. And that's when I got my first raise to $75 a week when I got married. So we built that business, but we realized in the late 50s, it wasn't a future. So we decided to start dabbling in furniture. And that helped because furniture was an item that there weren't that many furniture stores. Most of them were located in downtowns, not in shopping centers. So then we decided to open a furniture store and things took off from there. And we became quite successful in the furniture business. And so in early January of 1961, we got together with two brothers from Ohio that formerly worked for us in the house to house business. And we got together, we remained friends, even though they were former employees. And they had started a furniture business in Ohio. We got together, formed a partnership to open stores together as a partnership. And we became quite successful with that. And so from January of 61, I was in the furniture business. I retired several times, but my final, my third retirement was on my 93rd birthday. I gave him six months notice that I was going to retire from the business on my 93rd birthday. And I'm now 97, so that was four years ago. Well, so it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand uh, your twin brother is no longer with us. No, we lost him. It's, as we said, just a couple of weeks before I, our 93rd birthday, he went over the rainbow mm -hmm. because we were, I'm going to take off my rainbow cap. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I kept these glasses on all this time either. Didn't need those, but I don't realize I had them on. <laughs> so now you can see me. <laughs> yeah. So Hibby, uh, before we wrap up this interview, is there, um, how important was it for you and your brother to serve in the military? Well, it was, I'll say a tremendous experience that certainly matured us a lot faster than we would have been otherwise. But it was a great experience, but nothing we would ever want to wish on anybody else, mm -hmm. not on our children. We used to have a saying, there was one guy in our outfit, older guy, he was in his late 30s at the time, from St. Louis, Missouri. He used to have sayings. And one of his sayings was, if he had, ever had a son, the first thing he would do was cut off his right foot so that he couldn't march in the army. <laughs> I mean, it sounds unusual, but he had other sayings as well that I won't remark, but it was a great experience, I'd say, but nothing that I would wish on anybody else. Because okay. all the wars are different. Mm -hmm. And as far as my personal opinion is concerned, World War II was the last war 
that this country was involved in that was a true military event, nothing political. Every war since then, unfortunately, this country has been involved in had an element of politics involved to the detriment of success. Because of that, I preach often. In my opinion, I hope to God this country never enters into a military conflict with politics influencing entering the war or the activities. Because the military is there for a purpose. We need a strong military, but they have to do their thing and keep the politics out of it. And with that. Don't go to war unless the object is to win, period. Otherwise, stay out. And with that, uh, Hilbert Margo, we thank you so much for taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project.